Hello, my name is Kim Davenport. I am the Communications Manager for Tacoma Historical Society, and it is my great pleasure to welcome this month's guest speaker, Carla Stover, who is the author of a recent book uh, about which she will be talking, uh, Wicked Tacoma. Uh, which you, if you haven't had a chance to get your copy, we do have it for sale in our THS Museum shop. Uh, so welcome, Carla. Thank you for being with us. And I look My forward pleasure. to Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to your presentation. So take it away. Okie dokie. Well, I call it my pandemic project. And I can't speak for everybody else, but I did not have a problem at all with the pandemic. I like being home with my husband. And um, so we would get up and walk the dog run a few errands, McDonald's coffee was always available, and then come home and, and this became my project. But to do the project, I had to have access to newspapers and things. Now I subscribe to Genealogy Bank and that works pretty well. I really missed the library because I could not get the Tacoma Daily Ledger articles. I've since discovered that if you pay um, extra on your newspaper that you can subscribe to it through the Tribune. But at the time I didn't know that or it was not there. So I had to rely on things that I had already at home. Um, and I did have a lot of things in a giant file because I used to have a radio show and I, and I saved all of the newspaper clippings and, and things and then genealogy bank. And the nice thing about newspapers back when newspapers were really important was that all over the country, people would cover stories from a slightly different angle. And I would find stories about Tacoma in all kinds of different newspapers. So that really, that made it uh, great for me. Um, so I started with um, Genealogy Bank, um, opened it up. People are always asking, um, there we go, how Tacoma really got started. And so I wanted to have a timeline up here. Um, the timeline um, lets people know what happened to create Tacoma. So we have President Lincoln who signs up the Pacific Railroad Act. Then we have Congress who um, approves the Great Northern Railroad Company to connect us up. The Northern Pacific Railroad with Jay Cook as its bond agent. Uh, General John Sprague, gee, he's a nice looking man. General John Sprague, who was the Western Division Manager, and he came out and did all the scouting in the area. Um, we had um, Jay Cook going bankrupt, unfortunately, which caused a lot of trouble because they had to haggle around to find new backers. Then we have the telegram that Arthur Denny read in Seattle saying the terminus will be on Commencement Bay. I don't think Seattle has ever forgiven Tacoma for that. And then the first steam engine that arrived in uh, December on December 16th, 1873. But it wasn't without problems. Uh, the uh, money ran out because of, uh, of uh, Jay Cook going bankrupt and the men eventually went on strike. Now I found this picture uh, on the back of it, which I don't have access to, but on the back it was supposed to be the strike of the railroad here because the men quit, uh, they just quit working. I, when I look at this picture and I see this uh, woman and boy, I believe down here in the lower left hand corner, I often wonder if it was actually our railroad strike, but that's the way it's been labeled. So I'll take it verbatim. The men stopped out in the county and they barricaded the railroads and they were not going to work um, anymore until they got pay. Uh, of course, people were in a panic here. Um, the people who came out to help resolve the issue, um, uh, Elijah Ferry, who was governor, General Sprague, um, Hazard Stevens, to me, he looks like the czar of Russia. Hazard Stevens, J.C. Ainsworth, and this is Roger Green. And they came out in different uh, trains to talk to the men and see what they could do, what promises they could make um, in order for them to go back to work. And eventually concessions were made. Um, the men were given a number of different things. They did go back to work, but time was running out. The railroad had a dateline at the end of December 19, or 1873 to get this railroad done. And so with time running out, um, Edward Skookum Smith, um, who was in charge, 
uh, re chose the um, route the railroad was to take. I looked up Skookum because I've always liked that nickname. And that was a term my mother used to use. Um, and so Skookum means strong. In the case of a man, it's a monstrous nature, strength, hardworking. And he, he really um, put the pedal to the metal and got those guys going. And so they did, they did get the railroad complete. He actually chose part of the route that they were going to use. Now, I found this because in amongst my newspaper clippings, and obviously this is not um, here, but the first Tacoma crime I found took place in the 1860s, and um, or 50s rather, and it was an Indian that was accused of something. Swift justice, he was lynched and hung over one of the bluffs of the area. So I thought that was interesting. But the first real bad guy we had here was Charles Red. Charles Red was uh, part Cree Indian, um, Scots, and I noticed in my book today I have Scotch, Scotch Irish, um, Scots Irish, um, a little bit of English, uh, quite the quite the volatile person. He came down from Canada. He was working for the Hudson's Bay Company. He married a woman who was at least part Indian. Um, and then he had a farm. He filed for a claim on land well before the uh, Donation Claims Act was um, in effect. He filed for land out in um, Pierce County near Muck Creek. I go out to Muck Creek on occasion and walk around there. And I've wondered what happened to the creek because it used to go, it used to be gangbusters. And now the last I saw it was um, completely dead, uh, completely uh, rather um, empty non-running <laughs> but at any rate and that's where this little gravesite is you go up over a knoll you can't see it from the road you go up over the knoll and you find this little tiny uh and it's well-maintained grave site of charles and his first wife and their baby who died he um he was known for having cattle available for cattle buyers when none of his neighbors seemed to have any uh, he also would uh, mysteriously have horses from the uh, from Fort Nisqually or Fort Stillicum in his barn. Um, he hired a man to uh, was I think it was the first uh, murder for hire to take out a couple of his relatives. Um, the relatives who had property out in the area also, and I believe they were in-laws, um, kidnapped him out of a hotel in Olympia. They tied him to a tree and whipped him but it didn't do it any good. Uh, he healed up quite quickly. Uh, eventually, those two fellows were involved in a shootout down in, in um, Stillicum, which I've described in the book. Uh, Char uh, Charles was kind of run out of town. He goes up to Canada. He becomes a butcher, but he came back. He married, when his first wife died, he married her sister. I don't know where the sister is buried, but at any rate, this is where he is buried. I tried to find the graves of the two men who were killed down in Stillicum. I couldn't. I could only find a mention of the um, mention of the grave site, but not an actual picture. The name Tacoma was uh, sort of fought after a uh, gig harb or. Uh, um, Job Carr, as, as most people know, came over from Gig Harbor in a canoe looking for a place to homestead. And he uh, pulls up uh, at where Commencement Bay is and he shouts Eureka and that became the name. His son, Anthony, filed for a, tom, uh, a town site, a plot on the land and he called it Tacoma after the mountain. Then um, Martin Matthew McCarver arrived and he's looking around for land. He thinks the railroad terminus, which hadn't been um, determined at that time, would be down in Old Town. Anthony Carr's, uh, Job's son rather, a, that's not right. Job Carr sells land to MacArthur. Well, with the name already taken, uh, McCarver, with the name already taken, he calls it Commencement City. But a railroad surveyor suggested that it really should be Tacoma, so he calls it Tacoma City. Well, then, um, as I mentioned, Arthur Denny reads the telegram aloud to citizens in Seattle and asking the terminus will be here. However, the railroad, the Northern Pacific, wanted to have its terminus in its own town. So they 
um, had land and they plotted New Tacoma down mm, more or less where the uh, wheat terminals are uh, down the bay. If you look, drive down along the waterfront, you see those giant towers where the ships load up for wheat. And that's approximately where um, New Tacoma was. And then in 1883, the legislature uh, agreed to consolidate. They, they passed an, an act to consolidate both Tacoma and New Tacoma under the name Tacoma. So that's um, how we got to where we were. Now, Tacoma, of course, is wanting to make all kinds of laws. And the state wanted to make all kinds of laws about how we were going to live. Um, one thing they wanted to do was they wanted to outlaw smoking. Um, and there's a cute little quote in the paper, and it said, um, if home is not pleasant, there are streets. The boy who is driven there for his company finds it. He also finds cigarettes and whiskey and profanity. He finds a society that makes Jesse James a saint and Deadwood Dick a martyr. I did not even know there was a real Deadwood Dick. But I love this picture, boys smoking. And then this one over here, those are old cigarette labels, which were so colorful and so very attractive. And the amusing thing about this, to me at least, is I have a newspaper clipping from the 1950s, the dating December 24th, 1950. And in it, it says, and this is not in the book, it says, um, Quoting ordinance number 12232, it is unlawful to smoke, carry, or possess a lighted cigar, cigarette, or match on board any ship in Tacoma Harbor or on its decks. Um, this person who wrote this was looking at old laws that uh, had never been taken care of. Another thing that they, um, the people who, uh, the legislative people wanted to do was make Washington a dry state. There were a number of things that they were voting on frequently. Uh, women's suffrage was one of them, but of course that one never went. Every time that they would vote on a number of measures and there were always several included, they would use some, what we would call a line item veto and they would always whack out women's suffrage. I just like this picture of Tacoma beer. There were quite a lot of Germans here and a lot of them started uh, breweries. Um, there were so many different laws about liquor coming and going. It's hard to, uh, for me, it's hard to keep up. You could buy liquor usually at a pharmacist. Sometimes you had to have a prescription. Um, you could um, have liquor shipped in from out of state. What really be beyond a prohibition, which did um, a number of obviously on liquor, but what really helped the cause was when um, refrigerated railroad cars were invented. And so all the items needed could be readily shipped in. And um, so everybody was uh, making some sort of brew at some time or another, but prohibition came along. And so all of the issues in the state regarding beer or any kind of liquor was, were kind of a, um, a moot point by that time. Now, um, statehood was coming along. Um, that was in February 1889, and the president at the time, Grover, Cleaver, Gro Grover Cleveland, signed an act which said that Washington, Montana, and the two Dakotas could create um, delegations to draw up documents to present to Washington, D.C. to apply for statehood. So Washington drew up, our delegates drew up all of their documents necessary, and they sent um, a man by the name of J.W. Robinson back to Washington, D.C. with the document. We had hired a, um, a handwriting expert, a calligrapher, to make the documents particularly attractive, and we had mined gold from the state and created a pen that the um, president could use in which to sign Washington into a state. Well, Mr. Robinson got back to Washington, D.C., and the first thing that happened was the a seal fell off the document. And the president at the time, who was Harrison, um, he would not uh, sign the document because the seal wasn't on there. And Mr. Robinson said, but you, the seal's right here. You can see 
and um, it's just fallen off. And he said, nope, unless the seal is actually on the document, I won't sign it. So Harrison had to go um, to a telegraph office and have documents with the seal more firmly affixed, sent back to East. And then when the president got them, he said, this pen I always use is good enough for me. And he would not even use the gold pen. But at any rate, we got to be a state. Um, and I don't really consider those to be wicked stories. They're just more like unfortunate stories. Now, just about every city that's on a port, a, a saltwater port had problems with Shanghai. Um, this picture on the left is Charlie Chaplin from a movie, but the one on the right is a little bit more realistic. Men would um, come in to town. They would go uh, stay at a place possibly near the waterfront. They would be plied with liquor. Sometimes they would add, uh, the people doing that would add um, a, a narcotic of some sort. The men would had stowed all of their gear and um, Often these places had a, a trap door. They could just drop the bin through the trap door and uh, take them down to the waterfront. And that's what's happening in the picture on the right. He'd been dropped down a, a trap door and taken down to a ship on the waterfront and hoisted. And there were quite a number of articles in the newspaper about men who had been shanghaied. Um, if you go back and take a look, you could just find so many of them. In fact, at one time, uh, the the Tribune in the 1920s, uh, would have been the ledger then, um, had an article on, um, was there possibly a port for disappearing men? Um, they thought Tacoma might have been one of them, but women were disappearing too. They were being taken for all kinds of nefarious purposes. Um, so that was a real, that was a real issue back then. Now, one of the things that I enjoyed about writing this book was coming across things that I was not uh, knowledgeable, about, knowledgeable about earlier. Peter Stanup is a fellow that I was uh, not familiar with. Uh, we know Billy Frank Jr. because his name is on a number of different things. But Peter Stanup was a very well-respected um, advocate for the Puyallup Indians back in the uh, late 1880s. Uh, he had been educated down in Oregon, although the birding schools in Oregon were pretty much denigrated because children went down there and they got diseases and died. He survived. He was happy down there. He applied for um, a higher education. Unfortunately, his eyes were bad. And so he was not able to go on and go to any kind of college. He came back up here and he did a number of different things. He bought he responded to an ad in the newspaper for a printing kit, and he taught himself how to print, and he would print business cards for people and for his friends. He took a job at a newspaper called The Echo down in Olympia. It was a short-lived paper. It eventually um, moved to Tacoma, and then went, the paper just disbanded. But for a time, he worked for that newspaper. He became a preacher. Um, he preached for to the Indians. He also acted as their interpreter. But one of the things he was involved in was what the Native Americans could do with their land. And he said that they're not allowed to sell their own land. They have deeds, but they can't sell their own property. You can't eat a deed. You can't wear a deed. People need to be able to access their property um, and sell a portion of it if they need it for their own um, for their own needs. Now, at the time, the um, the uh, local people, especially the railroad people, wanted to be able to push the railroad across some of the Indian land, and he set up a fight against that. They they actually had a battle. Um, the Indians didn't have much in the way of weapons, but they got above a hill and they rolled logs down on the various men, soldiers for the most part, down below who were trying to protect the railroad. Um, one day, one night, somebody uh, came up to his house. He went outside to talk to them, left, and he was never seen alive again. He, his body was found um, in the bay. 
the uh, coroner said it was probably murder. He had what looked to be a bruise from a thumbprint on his arm. His neck was separated from the vertebra, first vertebra. Um, all of his internal organs were good. He hadn't been drinking or anything. He wasn't known to be um, a drinker, um, but there were a lot of blood clots inside of him. Months later, a bunch of his papers were found in a really good condition in a, in a satchel of some sort down in the water. Um, that somebody had them and had tossed them in later, but uh, Stanup died and nobody knows exactly what happened, which I think is very sad. I put this picture in because it's a relative of mine. Um, one of the things that I did not have um, a lot of information on, and so I didn't include it in the book, was any kind of counterfeiting. Now, this is an interesting article I found um, in from 1909. It's one of the first counterfeit type articles that I found. A man by the name of Mike Roche had been walking down the street, and he saw um, somebody apparently dropped what he thought was a bill. Well, he and another fellow picked it up and it was uh, supposed to be $100. Well, the um, other fellow said, well, we both picked it up. Why don't we just divide it? So he got Rosh to give him $50. Rosh took the bill, which turned out to be a counterfeit $100 bill. Very clever. Um, and I actually had a picture up here of some fake coins, um, but I thought that was a very clever um, way to do things. Um, I did laugh when I found an article that said for the third successive year, um, Tacoma has passed through the holiday season without any worthless bills turning up. The usual amount of small spurious coins were discovered, but no big bills. Which brings me to this relative of mine, Leroy Wakefield, Leroy, uh, Irwin Leroy Wakefield. He was um, lived down in Oregon and he was discovered living under a bridge um, uh, by the pillars of San Francisco Bay. Um, he said, I had to laugh, he said, he had merely crawled under the bridge to find a place to sleep and it was accustomed and was astounded to find himself in the counterfeiter's den. Well, it turned out that he had actually um, built himself a little house down under there where he was making, and the family story is that he was always making counterfeit pennies. I used to say to my dad that he didn't seem to have enough, much initiative and he was only making pennies. But um, there's some interesting things about forgery. About, oh, it's been a while back now, a friend of mine went up to one of the bookstores in Tacoma and bought a book. And when he came back to the office and opened it up, somebody had been using a, um, a Confederate bill as a bookmark. And so he gave it to me and I have it framed in the house. They're not valuable particularly, but I, uh, from time to time, those con old Confederate bills did turn up. Um, some other things that, um, that I have in the book, there were problems with animals all over the place. Um, dogs running rampant. Uh, one of my favorite stories was a um, chicken who uh, escaped from his chicken yard. He got into a church, hopped up on the pew, knocked water all over, or hopped up rather on the organ, organ knocked water all over, and um, put the organ out of business. Uh, people would poison the animals periodically, dogs particularly that roamed around. Some people wanted special places for their cows to graze. Other people wanted them to be able to roam free. There was a fellow in the Fern Hill area who went out hunting one day and he just had a small uh, gun rifle with him and uh, came across a bear. And why he decided he should shoot that bear with um, um, uh, a gun, a rifle that was not near big enough, I don't know, but he did. He shot the bear, um, didn't kill it. The bear attacked him. Um, they had a bit of a tussle. The fellow got away, he went home, changed his clothes, got a bigger, no, he didn't change his clothes, he got a bigger gun, that's right, went back, and eventually he killed the bear. So then he, um, he and his dad took the bear downtown to have it, um, have taxidermy done, and um, the fellow disappears from the, um, the census. I looked to see if he was still in the area. 
By that time, he decided he'd have his wounds treated and he disappeared from the census. There was um, a mother and her cubs up in the Eatonville area, uh, moseying around a couple of uh, milk cows. Two ladies went out to get their cows because they hadn't come home as they usually did in the evening, saw the bear. They would after the bear with um, a couple of pieces of log, uh, wood from a wood pile, a couple of logs, and uh, they chased the, way, uh, the bear away. There was a cougar that picked up a child and took off with it. Um, there was quite a lot of animal hijinks, if you were, going on. I have around here someplace a very small clipping about a um, business, I guess you'd call it a business, on Pacific Avenue. It was a fellow, it was, the whole thing was just chuck full of um, uh, pelts and all kinds of things that had been uh, mounted or, or um, tanned or whatever, but he didn't want to sell any of them. Um, he just, for some reason, wanted to have them on display. I didn't know West Coast Groceries was actually a place where you could um, or that, that sold furs. They took shipments of furs from all over. Uh, the, they have these things called belkies that came from Russia, pelts that came down from Alaska, and they would be doing up to $100,000 worth of business a year selling all of those pelts, which I thought was particularly interesting because um, women were wearing fur coats um, there were a lot of birds being shot for their feathers because women had those massive hats with feathers in them. Um, so it was quite an active business that was going on. Um, I thought that was extremely interesting when it came to dogs. Now I have a picture in the book of, um, at the time it was called the Coffee Pot Restaurant. As the twenties came along, um, the Java Jive was built down on the tide flats. It was a prefab. Uh, one of the very first prefabs in Tacoma. Uh, the parts were all made down there and it was taken up to site and put together. And that's the only reason it's in the book is because by the 1920s, things were changing rapidly in the area. There was a lot of concern about women um, being able to uh, go out, get jobs. They were not as, um, they were as constricted as they were. And one of the things that happened as a result of that is they got into trouble. And there was a woman by the name of um, Swain and her partner, Frederick LaPlante, and they were involved in white slavery. Um, Swain is interesting. Her ad says, she had huge ads in the paper. Um, and she said that she was a medium healer, a, trans, a transference seer, a metaphysician metaph metaph astral seer, a medium, and she was experienced in Japanese hair removal. Um, she was mostly in Seattle. She was also in Portland. She would travel around for a bit. She was arrested up in Vancouver, came down to Tacoma. Uh, she um, and her partner, Frederick LaPlante, had this little thing going. Um, a, a young woman would go to her for some sort of advice. And if it was appropriate, if the girl, for example, needed a job or something, she would recommend LaPlante's ice cream parlor down on Court C. And so the girl would go down there, she would get what she thought was a well-paying job. And the next thing you knew, she was involved in white slavery. Um, uh, LaPlante went to, or LaPlante ended up uh, going to jail, but Sear managed to get off. And she went back to Seattle and was doing the same things all over again in Seattle. Um, my father had been a, a police officer. He was the head of forensics. And so we were always interested in anything to do with the police and crime in Tacoma. My brother and I love the good crime story. Uh, the Tacoma police were everywhere at the time. They started out with a little building in, in the alley between McCarver and Star Street near 29th. Um, then they also had a place on G Street, and they had a place on a waterfront dock. Um, they moved to the south side of 30th Street at the foot of Carr, and that little station was used until the 1930s. Now up in New Tacoma, we had a police station at South 12th and A. 
Um, but also at the same time, uh, the um, articles mentioned a, another station at uh, South 21st of Pacific, uh, about which there is just about no information. Um, in 1899, the police department was in the basement of Old City Hall. They also had, uh, they had their offices on the Pacific Avenue side and the jail portion was on two different levels in the basement. Now, as of 1899, um, and I have my dad's police letter from 18, 18, I mean, 1999, um, those cells were still there. They were um, small and, and dungeon-like, but they were still there. Now in 1907, the city built a substation at South 52nd and Puget Sound. That was followed by another small brick or cement um, building at uh, 36 and, and um, 56th Street. In 1929, the police built a police. The police built a station, or the city had probably built a police station and jail across Pacific Avenue from Old City Hall, right next to the Northern Pacific headquarters. It was almost immediately too small, so the department expanded into the Northern Pacific building. Now, when my dad first started, uh, he, that's where he was working, and my brother and I remember him telling us that. One of the police officers was a friend of a chef at the top of the ocean restaurant. And when the um, restaurant closed at night, this officer would go down there on occasion to get all the leftover fried chicken and he'd bring it back. And uh, the men used to send chicken parts like drumsticks and things up and down the pneumatic tube system, which would occasionally get stuck. And about five days later, the whole place would just reek of rotting chicken, uh, which, of course, was expensive to clear out. Another thing down at that station was um, another officer who used to buy little those little ladyfinger firecrackers. And he'd go and he'd talk to somebody, be in an office doing something or other. He would, unannounced to anybody there, light it. Um, toss it down and then walk out and seconds later the thing would go off and would scare everybody. Um, that's the stories that my dad remembered from being down there. Um, eventually the police department moved into the county city building and not everybody was happy about that. Yes, it was a brand new facility, but it wasn't ex as accessible to the public and um, that, that bothered some of the men. Um, now, as far as what was going on in Tacoma at the same time, Peter Sandberg had come to town and he was kind of, I would call him the competition for Harry Morgan in the prostitution business. Now, in one of my other books, I talked about Harry Morgan and his places down in Opera Alley. Um, Peter Sandberg was at the opposite end of town. He was down around uh, 14th and A Street. Um, he came to town and he went in and bought a beer and the bartender kind of slopped the beer around and Peter Sandberg made a sarcastic remark about the fellow not being able to do his job properly where about the, uh, the barkeeper said, well, if you think you could do a better job, do it. And Sandberg did and eventually he bought the place. He bought um, the West Coast wagon factory that was near him. He bought the ham and bass. Now, this is something I haven't been able to quite figure out. He had he bought the ham and bass, which were right there around 14th and A, had a little barber shop attached to it. Years, not 12, it's maybe 10, 12 years ago, um, people doing work downtown discovered the remains of the old ham and bath. I don't know if it, or of an old bath, I should say. I don't know if that was Peter Sandberg's place or if it was another bath. Um, no one's ever put two and two together and I haven't been able to get into the Northwest room and do any uh, kind of snooping around myself, but the pictures of the bath are lovely. And um, Peter Sandberg was a going concern for quite a long time, although the women, oh, they were cavorting themselves around partially clad in front of windows. And um, there was not a particularly nice area of town um, periodically newspaper reporters would go down there and report on what you what they saw. One amusing story was a law was passed that um, gambling establishments could not be on a main floor. So the person who owned his particular bar 
put up a little platform a couple of feet tall and he moved all his roulette wheels and tables up on this little platform so it wasn't on the main floor. Eventually prohibition um, ordinances and different things being passed put Sandberg out of business. He tried other things, he just does, was not successful. And when he died, he left only $50,000, which um, considering how much he had earned in his lifetime was not a whole lot of money. Well, another thing that I was not familiar with and it was there for such a short period of time was the joy zone down at uh, Camp Lewis. When the camp opened and all the men began pouring in, um, some enterprising people decided they would build a little um, amusement area selling um, oh, pop and apples and having card games and some prostitution down near the camp. And it was called the Joy Zone. It was only there for about four months before eventually the land was acquired and it went out of business. But one of the things I really enjoyed putting in the book were little sidebars and I put in as many as I could. And this is one of them. It said, um, when the men arrived at the camp, there were 88,000 in all of them. After mustering in, 30,505 uh, were how, uh, found to have some sort of social disease. Um, they managed to cure a number of them, although I'm not quite sure how. Um, and so it, the number went down to only 1.22% per thousand. The commandant at the camp at the time decided the men needed a recreational area on the base, which was legal. And so he built his own park there. And he said, and I laughed about this because this is, has everything the um, enlisted man could ever want. And I thought, yeah, well, not women, but everything else there, because the men really did want to have women. Um, so it, the, it was taken down after about four months. Um, there were a lot of court battles around uh, the land and whether the, the shacks that were put up added to the value of the land or didn't. Um, and eventually the whole thing just kind of disappeared as all of these stories do. Another thing I wasn't familiar with or another person I was not familiar with was Ed Bentz. He was a Tacoma fellow um, who was involved in organized crime. He worked uh, or, or partnered for a time with Babyface Nelson. He robbed banks back east. He was a very smart fellow. He would go to the library when he got into a town. He would read up on the facility he was going to rob. And then he would go to the bank and he would pretend that he wanted to um, make a substantial deposit, but he wanted to see all of their security uh, precautions. And so the bank being ever obliging would show him their vaults or whatever it was they had going. And then a few days later, he would be able to go back, know exactly what he needed to do to um, get in and rob the, uh, rob the bank. He um, led some of the gangs, I believe Babyface was one of them into Washington State and they did some robberies in banks up north. Eventually he was arrested. He was found in a, um, an elevator shaft in his underwear trying to hide from authorities. Um, his comment was, send me to Alcatraz, all my friends are there. He did time for a while and he came back to Tacoma and, and he passed away here. Um, but I always thought he was kind of an interesting person. I think the saddest thing that I um, wrote about were some of the kidnappings. Now the kidnapping of um, the Warehouser boy had a, a fairly happy ending and I was always very impressed that Later in life, one of George Warehouser's kidnappers applied to him for a job and George hired him and put him um, to work down at one of the Warehouser plants down in Oregon. Um, the one about the Rust Boy, he was accused of maybe orchestrating his own kidnapping because he wanted the money, um, which didn't seem very feasible, but that was the rumor, and he never actually lived it down. Both he and his brother died young. On the Russ family, for all of their money and the beautiful house they have had on North 21st, um, did not have a particularly happy life, but um, it, he never lived it down, and he died young. The saddest one, of course, is the Matson boy, and his body was found up north um, in a field. 
Um, I remember that house. I remember going down in the backyard, seeing the pond and different things before it was torn down by that fellow who worked for the Frank Edwards company. Um, and it's just sad because uh, he was so uh, close to his mother and uh, I, these things are always sad. And there was just a massive, massive manhunt about this thing. And that, the last I saw, is still an open case on the FBI books to try to find out who had kidnapped and murdered that boy. Now, I ended up with organized crime. And organized crime in Tacoma is very tricky to, um, to try to follow. For one thing, of course, I didn't have access to the Tribune or any of the library uh, reference resources. So I had to rely on the newspapers. But for another thing is the organized, the people involved in organized crime kept as low a profile as possible. And the main, um, the main men were Frank Magrini and Vito Cotone. Um, I followed Vito Cotone for a little bit. I did use some of the census reports and things. Frank Magrini was harder because he was actively involved in horse racing and I, um, I uh, did not find a lot of things on horse racing. The thing to me that was interesting about Magrini was that he lived down near where I lived when I was a little girl. I was from the North End and my mother grew up in the North End and sometimes we'd go for a walk at night and she'd take me down and show me that house. And it had little tiny windows, little narrow windows facing gulch. Um, the family was always concerned that something, uh, someone would come through the windows or shoot through, shoot through the windows or that something would, would happen. Um, Catone just sort of went out of business. Uh, he was supposed to be head of the Italian mafia here. Supposedly, a lot of the East Coast and Chicago gangsters would hide out here. That I have an article in the book from one of the Seattle papers where they said that um, these fellows were coming here, um, holding up at a hotel someplace arming themselves and just wait until the uh, things cooled off from wherever they came. Um, I wrote the FBI, asked them for information regarding Katoni. Um, supposedly they had been following his activities, but they came back and said they couldn't find much of anything. Um, and so it's, um, it's not as, I wish that I could have had more. Um, and perhaps someday I'll be able to find more. I don't know why the FBI didn't have things. The other person involved was um, everybody's favorite madam, um, Amanda True Love. When the crime file, uh, crime um, lawsuits were on the news, and Amanda True Love in particular was scheduled to um, to, to uh, testify, and I don't know if anybody remembers, but that downtown they would have the tvs in the windows all hooked up and you could stop outside the window and watch and the streets would be lined with people they couldn't hear what was going on but at least they could see what was going on on the trials and apparently um the trial then on on crime that was going on in tacoma um uh, trounced everything else on the air at the time nobody was paying any attention to anything except the trials that were going on uh, I did cover a story about a man who hid in uh, a dugout basement during the war. He went AWOL. He didn't want to fight. So he dug himself a, um, a hiding place down in his cellar. And he hid down there for about a year and a half. He would go out at night. Um, he would go hunting on occasion. But during the day, he was always down in the cellar. Um, neighbors would report seeing somebody and his wife always said, well, um, he's a handyman or he's this or that. Um, eventually, because the uh, police and the military police had to check out every one of the claims that they'd seen um, this fellow um, on his property, uh, they had to check out every one of these claims. And so they went down, they would, they would go. Um, this one time, however, they picked up a rug and saw a trap door and they went down in the cellar and behind the stairwell was another little sub basement hidden. And he, he was hiding back in that little sub basement. Um, so eventually he got arrested. He said that he'd been ill and been trying to get out of the army 
Um, however, when Pearl Harbor was uh, attacked, he knew <laughs> that wasn't going to be happening anytime soon, so he just decided to go AWOL. The thing that's amusing to me is that he was arrested, taken to jail, but the next day he was allowed to go back to the house with newspaper reporters so they could take a whole bunch of pictures for the paper. That's uh, one of the things that used to happen in the old days that always amused me. And there's a, there's a whole lot more in the book. Um, there's a, there was a cross dresser roaming around the streets and, and just stuff. I love all this stuff, but um, that's it. I don't think I have anything else to say. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.